Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear guests, on behalf of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, I would like to extend our warm greetings and welcome you all to tonight's lecture titled The Future of Arab-African Relations, Opportunities and Challenges. This lecture will focus on the evolution of African-Arab cooperation as one of the oldest forms of regional relations. It far exceeds a simple geographical bond and has a significant impact on all aspects of economic, cultural, and human development and relations. The lecture will examine the reasons for interaction among the African and Arab people. It will trace their evolution and development and examine how the present international political, economic, and social order has affected both the African and Arab people. Against this backdrop, the lecture will review current African-Arab relations within the eras of industrialization and globalization and examine recent efforts to adopt a strategy for an Arab-African partnership to tackle the challenges of these phenomena. Particular attention will be given to the common denominators that should give rise to a greater unity in order to map out a common destiny. Finally, the lecture will explore how South Africa and the United Arab Emirates can together contribute to fostering a spirit among their people that will help propel the African Arab diaspora. Presenting the lecture tonight is Professor Edward Maloka, who has served as the Special Advisor to the Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation of the Republic of South Africa since 2009 and is currently South Africa's Special Representative to the Great Lakes Region and Adjunct Professor at the University of West Waters Rand School of Governance, Public and Development Management in South Africa. Previously, Professor Maloka was a Special Advisor to the Deputy President of the South Africa, Advisor for the NEPAD Secretariat on Governance, Public Administration and Post-Conflict Reconstruction, and an African legacy delegate for the 2010 FIFA World Cup Organizing Committee. He served for four years as the Chief Executive Officer of the Africa Institute of South Africa and was a lecturer at the University of Cape Town, along with world's premier universities, including Oxford and Princeton. Professor Maloka is concerned with political and developmental issues in Africa including the history of the liberation struggle in South Africa and has been Vice President for Southern Africa of the Association of African Political Science and President of the South African Association of Political Studies. Professor Maloka holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Rhodes University, a Master's in Development Studies from the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Geneva, a PhD in History from the University of Cape Town, and a postdoctoral fellowship from Princeton University. Professor Maloka, I kindly request you to approach the podium to present your lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Program Director. I'm too tall for the podium. I don't know how to stand. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I apologize. She's, uh, the lady is very short, but uh, she's got the correct height. I'm the one who's got more height than I need. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for the introductions uh, and also, of course, to the center and uh, the Deputy Director General, Mr. Ahmad. Thank you very much for, for inviting us. And uh, my friend and our ambassador, Ambassador, uh, uh, he's been here for, for a year already and he's one of the most active ambassadors we have of South Africa. So I'm very have, uh, grateful that he, he did all he could to make sure that South Africa also will come and share with you our thoughts on the, on the topic at hand. And I must also, of course, uh, 
thank everybody who's here for, for their time and for the presence and, and ladies and gentlemen. I've been asked to talk about, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a very interesting topic. We don't talk about it a lot. When I say we, I mean uh, on the continent we don't talk about it a lot. And I think we should be. Among academics, people do talk about it a lot, but uh, I'm not sure among policymakers. Afro-Arab relations today and what are the opportunities and what are the challenges and what is the future? And I think that uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very timely topic because of the developments that are taking place in Africa and also in this part of the world, which are linking the two regions together, even though we at policy level are not looking at the, the importance of the relations between the Arab world and, and Africa. But I will approach the topic from an African perspective. Not that I don't value the Arab perspective, but because I'm more familiar with the African side of the story. And then I leave the, the Arab side of the story to the experts and those who work on this region. Myself, I've worked on Africa for, for, for a while. Relations between our continent, meaning Africa, and the Arab world back, date back to the antiquity, to the ancient times, and indeed flourished with the rise of Islam in the 7th century and after. Many of the people who today consider themselves African are of Arab origin or are Af 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 Arab descent, and many more, and indeed from Cape to Cairo, including my own country, many of our people on the continent consider Islam as their faith. In the West, uh, and particularly in the media, academic and in, and in, in political circles, the Arab world is presented as a threat to Western civilization through the prism of the infamous doctrine of the clash of civilization. And we'll remember that a few years ago, some of us were quite young. Edward Said wrote several years ago about how the Orient was once a fantasy to the Western mind. Africa, of course, has its own share of stereotypes from being called the dark continent to the dominant tendency we find today in the, in the Western media of reducing our continent to a land of famine and wars. There is nothing good that comes out of Africa when you look at what is happening in the media and so on. But Africans also have their own images of their Arab world. And these images are being formed as we speak and are very complex. And I want to refer to some of uh, the, you could say, the, the strands of ideas of influence that influence how Africa perceives and sees the Arab world. The first one is, of course, the security situation in Iraq, which is quite, uh, of course, way back in the 1990s, and, then, and recently the security situation in, in, in Syria. So they look at the Middle East through the, this is the window through which our continent looks at the Arab world with what is happening in Iraq, with what is happening in Syria. And of course, the second thing, including in my own country, is the Palestinian struggle for the right to self-determination. Many of us see the Arab world through the Arab, through the struggle of the Palestinians, and many of us, including some of us even, and many of us who grew up in the African National Congress, when you think of the Arab world, the first thing that comes into our mind is the struggle of the Palestinians for their right to self-determination and the Israeli aggression we witnessed recently in Gaza. It really uh, reaffirms the importance. And then the third, of course, is the, we associate the Arab world with wealth and the abundance of oil and natural oil and gas resources. And for us who come from South Africa, we look at that and contrast it with our own situation because we are an oil importing country and oil dependent. And one of the missions that the government is, is working on at the moment is to address that because it's a strategic uh, uh, a challenge that we face as our country. And then, of course, the fourth uh, window through which Africa looks at the Arab world is what we call political Islam. And, of course, the incidents of international terrorism, which are also affecting us on the continent as we speak, in Nigeria with Boko Haram. Of course, Mali, you know, there was, there was a secessionist attempt. Algeria, of course, also is affected. Libya, as we see it, in the Horn of Africa, especially in Somalia, and with recent attacks in Kenya which were claimed by some elements of al-Shabaab. 
The arrow spring is also the window through which we look at the, at the, at the, at the Arab world. And for us in Africa, when the Arab Spring began, from Tunisia spreading across different parts of North Africa and also flowing into some parts of the, of, of the Middle East, the big question, and of course my brother from here, from Egypt was here, we had a big heated debate whether the regimes that were coming out of the Arab Spring were these the regimes that we should recognize. Because in Africa, we have taken a very strong position against unconstitutional change of government. And, uh, and our friends from Egypt, of course, they were quite unhappy when South Africa did not recognize the government in Egypt. That emerged as a certain stage of the transition that we, but currently, of course, we work quite well with the Egyptian government. So this has been quite a debate and it's ongoing as we speak. How do we characterize and how do we relate with events? Are the regimes that are coming out of this process, the regimes that are expression of the popular will of the people from the region, are they democratic or are they a regression? Are they taking the continent back and so on? And this is an ongoing debate and is going to be with us at least for, uh, uh, for a while. But I must also ask, uh, uh, confess that, uh, uh, and maybe I'm speaking for people in our region, in the southern part of, South, of Africa, we don't know this region well. Some of us, we confuse, we sometimes think that Iran is part of the Arab world, and we didn't realize that no, Iran, Iranians are actually not Arabs, and sometimes we confuse the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council with the Arab League. So you must also pardon our own ignorance. So our own images of the Arab world are a little bit, you could say, uh, a mix of what is we read in the media, a mix of our own affinity, of our own affection with the struggle of the Palestinians, and our own experiences with the Arabs, brothers and sisters that we live with on the continent, in the Horn of Africa, and also in parts of North Africa, and so on. What is left out of the, in these dominant images of the Arab world is, of course, the contribution that the Arabs have made to human civilization. That the first seeds of human civilization, as the Homo sapiens step out of the jungle and transform their animality into humans, were actually planted in this region is sometimes, if not often, forgotten. It is in this region that some of the most ancient cities were born. This region also gave the world three most dominant and monotheistic religions or faiths in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And not only do we know of celebrated pioneers in, uh, of Arab origin, in mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, and medicine, of course, especially between the 7th and the 13th centuries. But you don't always acknowledge the, 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 the midwife role played by Arab civilization in the birth of what we know today as the Western world. And some, and I'm one of those people who argue that perhaps without the contribution of the Arab civilization, maybe there will not have been European civilization. Because what triggered, in my view, European and Western civilization was the influence of the Arabs through Spain and other parts of Europe, as we know it, through the Islamic Golden Age. In our own judgment and stereotypical generalizations about political Islam, we forget that other dominant religions, notably Christianity, Judaism, and Hinduism, have not entirely escaped being politicized themselves, including incorporating into their discourse the use of violence to achieve for political ends. We know also of the so-called neoconservatives in the Western world who see the state as an instrument to pursue the objectives of the Christian faith. And also, it can also be argued that political Judaism is also a factor in the current impasse we face, which has a tendency to deny the Palestinian their right to self-determination and not accept the two-state solution to the situation that is uh, prevailing between the Palestinians and, and, and so on. However, mourning about the negative images of the Arab world will not help us to go anywhere, nor to, uh, help us overcome the challenges of the modern world. Africa has a long history of connection and relations with the Arab world. We and the Arab people are neighbors. The Kiswahili language in that is so spoken and is dominant in Central and East Africa is a product of centuries of connection between the Arab and the African people, especially in the medieval period in the 16th century 
and so on. What is today parts of Zanzibar and so on and so on. Our modern nation states in Africa and the regions that we are here today have somewhat a similar history and are quite recent in their own origin after the Second World War and, some, uh, and so on. The distinction between the so-called Sub-Saharan Africa and what is called North Africa, sometimes it is sometimes intended to de create divisions and deny many of the people of Africa, of North Africa, their African belonging. We do have a debate in Africa. In the African Union, we don't make a distinction between uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. But when you look at the reports of some of the international agencies, notably the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, they, they tend to have reports for Sub-Saharan Africa and then they say, then Africa, and they say North Africa and the Middle East. We don't use that distinction in the African Union. We look at Africa in its entirety as a continent, from Cairo, Tripoli, Mauritania, up, down, and to Cape Town as one single uh, continent of African people. We believe in what Julius Nyerere said several years ago, when he was still alive, that the skin color of our people, or the Sahara, the divide caused by the Sahara Desert, should not be a barrier between our people, but a bridge. But this has not stopped Africans from debating among themselves about this, this reality. You do find, uh, so the road has not been easy. There have been times when this distinction is overplayed, and some of our detractors, as you know, give an interpretation to the, uh, when they interpret the connection between Africa and the Arab world, they do so in a very unhelpful and unconstructive manner. We do have a debate, if you look at what African academics sometimes talk about, every standard text, when you, when you, which you read on Africa, on Afro-Arab religions, it will start about the, the, the slave period, then it will talk about, and currently, of course, up to quite recently, one dominant issue was the situation in Sudan, which was, uh, to, main, to some Africans, was uh, uh, seen as a, as a fight between the Arab North and the so-called Black African South. But of course, these are two separate countries and the problem has been partially resolved. But these are some of the things that, uh, of course, have dominated the discourse on the continent on the relations between the Arab world and, and, and Africa. And of course, uh, the, the other issue which is worth mentioning here is the contentious issue over the last few years one of the contentious issues has been the relations with Israel. Because uh, in this region, quite a number of countries in this region have a very strong and a very strong tradition of particular relations with Israel. But on the African continent, whereas most African countries will go with the Arab world on relations with Israel, they will then be, even in the past, even during in the 60s, uh, early, late in the 50s and maybe in the 60s, during the relation, even one of the thorny issues in the relation between Kwame Nkrumah and Abdel Nasser was the relationship that Kwame Nkrumah had with the State of Israel at that time. So the issue of the relations with Israel and certain countries, it always comes up as one of the contentious issues and thorny issues in Afri African relations. But nonetheless, Africans of African descent, of Arab descent, have played a key role in Pan-Africanism. And I've just mentioned Abdel Nasser himself, including in the formation of the Organization of African Unity in, 19, in the 1960s. And Nasser, we know, and Kwame Nkrumah themselves were key figures in the radical group which viewed Pan-Africanism in anti-colonial and anti-imperialist terms. And you know that one of the things that to, to show the bond, strong bond of friendship between Ghana of Kwame Nkrumah and Abdel Nasser, you know that uh, Kwame Nkrumah, he married an Egyptian against the will of the family of the lady and then the Egyptian came and lived with Ghana and, and Abdel Nasser played a key role in encouraging and playing a bridging role. It was seen as a, as a, as a, as a way of strengthening. I'm not saying it's right to marry people to each other these days, but it's one of the things that happened during that time. And of course, in the transition from the organization of African OAU and to the African Union, which happened in the early part of the 2000 and was concluded in 2002, we cannot talk about that transition from the OAU to the African Union without reference 
to the role that was played by, Colonel, by Colonel Gaddafi. You remember that it was insert in Libya that the OAU took a decision to fast track its transition. And of course, the personal uh, role that was played by Colonel Gaddafi, we will debate what were his motive, what was the thinking behind, but we cannot deny that historical fact that perhaps had it not been for his personal role and his interest in the subject, we will not be having the African Union today, we will still be having the OAU. So we cannot deny that a lot of Africans, a lot of Arabs who live on the continent played a key role in the development and the evolution of Pan-Africanism and in the formation of our regional structures, notably the African Union. And I can also, also mention that NEPA, the new Partnership for African Development, which is a socio-economic program of, of the continent, the five founding members, in the five founding members, of course, you've got South Africa, you've got, you've got uh, uh, Senegal, but you also have the core members, the founding members, Egypt and Algeria. So, so Egypt and Algeria also were quite key, and they played a key role in the conception. I remember I was part of that team. One of the first meetings we had was, of course, with the Algerians, with the Egyptians, in constructing, thinking through how we're going to do this. To this day, these are called the founding five, and then they drive the NEPAD program on the African continent without saying this, uh, uh, this and so so generally, I will argue, there is an overlap between Pan-Africanism and Pan-Arabism of the 1950s and 1960s in terms of personalities and the political agenda of the two movements, the anti-colonial content, unity, self-reliance, and socialist ideas at the time, you remember, and with the view, socialist ideas meaning that uh, not necessarily in the Soviet style, a strong state at the center of socioeconomic development in the country. And of course, in this, you always have the role of Nasser and Nkrumah, and you cannot forget and keep out of this equation the influence of the Algerian liberation struggle under Ben Bella, who in my own country is still a revered anti-colonial figure to this day. The, the, the African continent uh, is undergoing a transformation of its own as we speak. Uh, not long time ago, the, one of the magazines, the international uh, magazine, The Economist, spoke very badly about our continent. I can't remember what was the title. We were all angry and we wrote rebuttals of it. I think it was, say, Africa, a lost continent or some, a dark continent. I can't remember. But a few years days, about a decade late, it had to revise its own perception and its own discourse on our continent and write a rebuttal of its own position that it had articulated a decade earlier. From the 60s, the, of course, in the 1960s, when you got our independence, there was a lot of optimism on the continent, and uh, we, we, we built new post-colonial states with a one-party state, and uh, another time the leaders felt that you need a one-party state, you don't need multi-party system, because multi-party system, it will lead to ethnic groups organizing uh, politically to lead to a uh, threat to nation building and so on and so on. But later in the evolution of the post-colonial state, there were excesses and there were difficulties. Already by the, by the 70s into the 1980s, we had military regimes on the continent, serious atrocities which were committed against our own people, economic decline, suffering for our own people, exclusion, poverty, and really a degeneration of the continent. And that's why to many development scholars, the 1980s in Africa are considered the lost decade. But to us, with the, end of the, with the end of the Cold War, one of the developments on the continent was, you could say, a resurgence of the masses that had liberated the continent in the, 19, in the 1960s. Uh, from one country to another, and of course we've just buried the president of Zambia, but Zambia was one of the countries that opened the way with the emergence of this mass movements calling for multi-party system on the continent. So it was our own, you could say, uh, version of what would later be called the Arab Spring. This was basically to a decade of the 1990s to the 2000s. And a lot of governments changed, the constitution changed, multi-party system, and we can sit and talk about what were the pros and cons, what has been achieved, and so on. But it helped in transforming the post-colonial state. So the excesses of the 80s and some of the the orientation elements in the orientation of the post-colonial state that, that developed in the 1980s started to disappear, and then certain things were accepted, etc. 
But in the context of that, going into the 2000 and so, of course, we see the emergence of the African Union, NEPAD, and then the, 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 the resurgence of the debate that, we used to, that took place in the 1960s, 1960s of the establishment or the creation of the United States of Africa. And Colonel Gaddafi was one of the proponents, uh, but we didn't agree with his methods, but uh, he was one of the leading voices on the creation of the United States of Africa. And it was a big debate, the union government, whether you should have, and some people wanted to have this United States of Africa in 10, 20 years, and so the states like South Africa, like Nigeria, like they were just going to become provinces in a confederation of, Af of, of uh, a confederation to be called or a federal state to be called a United States of Africa. And at that time, Colonel Gaddafi, of course, he said himself he will be the president. And that's why one of the reasons that some people were very unsettled. And it used to divide the meetings. We used to meet until early in the morning. The Egyptian brother will know how difficult those debates were on the creation of the United States of Africa. So, so and, and the issues really were... Africans recognize that in order for us to get ourselves out of this situation, we have to deal with three interrelated things. The first one, we have to deal with the development. So we have to develop our continent. But in order to develop our continent, we need to sort out two things. One, we need to put to an end conflicts on our continent. And then secondly, we need to change the nature of the post-colonial state. We need to make it more representative, more responsive to popular demand, and it must be informed by people and, and, and popular participation. And so, so you had this whole thinking, and this is the thinking that led to the development of NEPAT, that development, peace and security, and democratization in a responsible and accountable state, the three of them are interlinked and so on and so on. And then as I speak to you now, today we are talking about a new agenda for our continent, which is uh, Agenda 2063, when we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the formation of the, African Union, of the African Union or the OAU last year, one of the decisions our leaders took was to say, look, we have seen what happened to our continent since the 1960s when we got our independence. What we need to do into the next 50 years, we must not be the objects of history, but the subjects of history. And how do we do that? We must now plan ahead the next 50 years. We must say, where must Africa be in the next 50 years, in the year 2063? So as I'm speaking to you now, throughout the continent, including my own country, there are consultations. We have just had some consultation in our national parliament now, last week. There are consultations on what should be the Africa in 2063. So now in December, there's going to be a plan of action, which is going to be presented, and then with some of the follow-up and implementation modalities. And so, so we're trying to think differently. So this is where the continent of Africa is going to. And I can't say much about this region because I don't stay in this region and I'm not. That's why I said I'll speak from an African perspective. But I think there are six areas, or you could say six streams where opportunities exist for enhanced Afro-Arab relation and cooperation into the future. The first one is the, what I call the partnership, the partnerships. Uh, we do have an Afro-Arab partnership. Of course, the first summit took place in 1977, but then subsequently there wasn't much, nothing much. And now in the 1990s, there was a resurgence, but it was only now in Libya in 2010, I think, where we had a summit, and the last summit took place in Kuwait, and the Afro-Arab uh, Afro -Afro 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 uh, uh, partnership. We, as part of that, there is an action plan for covering the period 2011 to 2016. Uh, of course, based on a wide range of areas from political cooperation to trade and economic issues. This is supposed to be a six-year plan, and it's, it's an intensely intergovernmental exercise with summits, ministerial meetings, and senior officials, uh, component uh, assessments, and so on. So it's a, it presents a potential, this Afro-Arab -Afro -Afro partnership, it presents a potential for region-to-region -region cooperation, because on the African continent, we do have some partner. We have quite a number of partnerships. We have a partnership with the Chinese. We call it FOCAC. Uh, so this one is more, it's what we call 
continental country partnership and South Africa will be co-chairing uh, with, the, with the Chinese I think from next year and then we've got TICAT with the Japanese, the Turkish also there's one, there's Afro-Turkish uh, partnership, there's going, going to be a summit now, we've got one which is continent to continent between the EU and Africa, we've got AGOA which is more like trade with the Americans and so on and of course also with the Indians there's a partnership so they, in that context there's also an Afro-Arab partnership and in this Afro-Arab partnerships, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a program, an action plan that is agreed between the two sides and so on. And one of the issues around the partnerships, which tends to be difficult, is the coordination, the follow-up mechanisms. Uh, you see with other countries or regions, it will be difficult because, for example, one of the member states of, uh, on the continent, one of the countries on the continent, walked out of the OAU and then the AU. It's not a member. So in the partnership, some of the partners want to have this country as a member of the partnership. So then there's always a problem. Do you have a, pro a relationship with the African Union or do you have a relationship with African countries? So in the case of the Afro-Arab relationship, there's no such a debate because the coordination is done by the African Union Commission and the Arab League. But the problem is that as I speak, it's one of the least active partnership programs. Actually, definitely least, less, far less active than the partnership that exists between the Chinese and the, and, 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 and the African continent. So if we're to move forward, we just have to get the Afro-Arab partnership that exists with this action plan, with the follow-up mechanism, fully operationalized. But I think there's also a thinking that we have created too many bodies for implementation. And I think those bodies have to be rationalized. We just need to have a thin structure for follow-up and implementation of the action plan. So I think that's the first area in the partnership field to make sure that this Afro-Arab partnership that we have in place, coordinated jointly by the African Union Commission and the Arab League, operates, implements this action plan that was agreed in Tripoli. So that's the first area. The second area, it's coordination and collaboration in international organizations, especially in the Nanalan movement and the G77. And you can also say also in the Security Council, because even though none of us is a permanent member, but we do have non-permanent members, and there are some key issues in the Security Council that come up from time to time. I know, like, for example, now there's a resolution in the Security Council on the Palestinian uh, table by the Palestinians through, through the Arab League, and, uh, and of course, South Africa, we are not in the Security Council, but it's important that there's coordination on that resolution between the Africa Group, between the Arab League, but also between members of, of, on the Security Council who come from Africa and also come from the Arab, the Arab world. So the issue of coordination in the Security Council is very key to make sure that we get our issues through, even though none of us is a Security Council member, permanent member, is very important. But we also have to coordinate our actions around the UN reforms because the UN reforms are to the interest of both regions. None of us is a permanent member. None of us has a significant voice in the Security, in the security Council, the issue of the UN reforms. So as Africa, we have a common position. In Africa, we take common positions. We always say that the African continent is the most united continent in the world because we take common positions. So we do have a common position on the, on the Security Council reforms, it's called Ezulini Consensus because it was agreed in Ezulini in Swaziland in 2005. And our position is really on the, it talks about uh, uh, Africa wants two permanent seats. Our friends from Egypt, they are hoping to get one of the two permanent seats. And uh, my brother here, two permanent seats, but these seats must come with a veto. And of course, five non-permanent seats. And then in New York, you know that the intergovernmental negotiations, I think they are three years old now, they are taking place and uh, there is already a document in place and there are different groups and so on. But Africa meets and then there is a committee of 10 African countries led by Liberia, uh, by Sierra Leone, that is leading the African common position. So there is an opportunity here for our two regions to try to coordinate. But I'm not sure where the Arab, the, you could say the Middle East countries stand on this uh, on the union reforms, whether there is a collective position from the region, whether what are the aspirations of the region on representation. I know that the, in Asia there are countries like Japan, uh, countries like India in Europe, there are countries like Germany, and there is also Brazil. They have aspirations to be in the future Security Council, but I don't know from this region what is the thinking, and it's one of the things that I'm about. Clearly in Africa we are looking at two permanent seats from this team. So the other issue in the, 
in the UN space is, of course, the negotiations, current negotiations on the post-2015 uh, dispensation. You know that next year the, the, the Millennium Development Goals, they come to an end as they were conceived in 2000. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an intense debate in New York on what should replace the Millennium Development Goals. What sort of a developmental dispensation should replace the Millennium Development Goals? And Africa has taken a position. We have a common position also, and there's the African common position on post-2015. And, and the, the lead champion for our common position, of course, Liberia, the president of Liberia. And the essence of our position is that uh, the, the post-2015 development agenda must give adequate attention to the development of the productive capacity of our countries. Because the way the Millennium Development Goals were conceived, they were a minimum package reduce poverty, child mortality, this, and so, but they were not about the productive capacity of countries in uh, uh, building the countries, making sure that the countries are able on themselves, on their own, to sustain and to move forward and then to transform internally and to, to upscale their own development. And this is the core message that Africa is trying to, to argue for. But maybe the, Gulf, uh, the, the GCC countries the MDGs may not be a big issue, but some in the region, may, in your region, may be thinking maybe they are because there are one or two least developed countries that fall in the Arab, that are part of the Arab countries, and and they will benefit. And some of them, of course, are not meeting the Millennium Development Goals. So the issue of coordination between Africa, in multilateral organisation and the Arab world, on the post 2015 agenda is quite key because it may not affect countries that are opulent and wealthy, but certainly those that are still faced with significant, serious development challenges is something that we have to look at. The, the other issue that uh, I think in the international organization that we should be coordinating uh, uh, actions are, is on climate change negotiations. The current climate change negotiations, we hosted uh, ourselves, South Africa, uh, in, in 2011, we hosted uh, COP, 6, uh, COP 17, and COP 18 took place in Qatar. I was, uh, in, in Doha, we handed over to Doha. And the key issues here, of course, are around uh, a legally binding agreement, which was agreed, and a roadmap was agreed in, in, in South Africa. And in the process of agreeing, developing and agreeing this uh, 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 legally binding agreement on, 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 on climate change, of course, is supposed to be concluded in 2015. So 2015 is a key year. MDGs and also on, the, uh, on, on climate change. And then it must be in effect by 2020, meaning that it, the ratification process uh, is given five years uh, and so on. So, so finally, the other issue under the, the multilateral, in the multilateral space where they are opposed the way there are opportunities for the two regions to work together, it's on the reform of the British institutions. Uh, Africa is a much poorer continent, but I think that uh, the United Arab Emirates on its own can buy out a lot of countries and uh, help in the big fight around shareholding in the International Monetary Fund and the IMF. I saw now a story now recently in the newspapers by the the, the chair, the lady, the French, uh, who's the head of the IMF, about the, because the, the way the Bretton Woods were constructed after the war, they were divided between two countries. The Americans took the, led the World Bank, and the Europeans led the IMF. But this is no longer a tenable formula. The Chinese have a lot of money, the GCC countries also have a lot of money, and so on. So we should allow these countries also to have more say and more representation. And us as Africa, we also, we are 54 countries, we want to have more say and more voice, more representation in this institution. So it's something that brings us together. It's something that uh, uh, of now there will be the G20 and it's one of the issues in the G20, the reform of the international financial architecture. And at the core of this international financial architecture is the British News institutions. And uh, you know that South Africa is a member of BRICS, and uh, in the BRICS family, we, have cre we are creating a new development bank and also an investment uh, uh, and, uh, uh, agency. So, 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 the, so it's, it's important that we, as developing countries, that, the, that we recognize that it's important that we work together 
on the reform of this international financial institution. And it must be concrete. At least there's an agreement. I'm told that the Americans are yet to ratify it on giving more shareholding to developing countries. And countries that, like uh, in, this, in the GCC, that have the financial muscles should be more, uh, should be given more, uh, should be able to use their own resources to get more representation, more voice. Because the more diverse the voices, the better, uh, and, and, and so on. So, so really I was looking at uh, the second stream. So the first stream I said is the partnership stream. The second one is coordination and collaboration in international organizations. And I was just going through some of the dominant issues that are taking place in multilateral organizations currently. But there is a third stream, which is the South-South Cooperation stream. You know that uh, in the 19, 1970s, we started talking about South-South cooperation, on technical cooperation, political cooperation, economic cooperation, and so on. But the meaning of South-South cooperation today has changed because a number of countries of the South have, uh, have, are now, a, 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 you could say, a significant, have significant weight today, possess significant weight in the economic balance of forces globally. There was a report now by the, of course, uh, Mr. Ahmad was telling me that the Director General of the Center has written an important book on this subject. But clearly, there is some, some research which suggests that the current balance of forces between the Western countries and the countries of the South, at least in the economic space, will not be like this in the next 30 years. There is a new, uh, there is a reconfiguration taking place China, India, Brazil are beginning to emerge as eco important economic players. So South-South cooperation today has a different meaning. And, uh, and of course, the GCC countries themselves are, 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 are a factor in this. And Africa, even including South Africa, puts a lot of weight to, to South-South cooperation. So South-South cooperation is an important issue. And I think it's a, it's a framework within which the partnership or the relationship between the Arab world and this part of the world can work. And then, of course, the, 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 there's, uh, there's also solidarity on the Palestine, which I've mentioned. I won't go into it, especially now in the Security Council and, some, and the General Assembly on, this, on, the, on the question of the statehood for Palestine. And then the peacekeeping and peacemaking. Of course, you not, uh, the region is not that active in peacekeeping. But of course, in peacemaking efforts, some of the countries from this region have tried to play some mediation role on the African continent, but not that much. But there's an opportunity for, for the two continents or two regions to work together on, uh, on, in the peace space and, uh, and also in post-conflict reconstruction and development, the PCRD. Uh, this thing. And then finally, of course, is the language and religion cooperation. In South Africa, we do have, uh, uh, we do have quite a lot of uh, educational centers that promote and teach the Arab language. Uh, and uh, myself, I can't speak Arabic, but there's quite a lot of South Africans who speak Arabic. It's a, it's a popular language, especially in the Western Cape. It's been taught, and it's uh, Arab literature, Arab culture, and of course, uh, Islam as well as the religion. It's, it's, so it's, a, it's an area that, of course, we recognize that it, it's, uh, it brings the two regions together. Islam is quite strong in West Africa, in Senegal, Mali. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's the dominant religion in parts of East Africa, of course. Even, even in Tanzania, it's a dominant religion. So it's, a, it's an area for, for, the two, for the two regions, of course, to work together. And then I cannot, of course, finish without talking a little bit about my own country, South Africa and South Africa's relations with this, uh, with this part of the world. And to say that uh, the Gulf region remains the source of, uh, of most of South Africa's crude oil. South Africa is an oil dependent country. And at the same time, a major market for, the, for our products and professional services. A source of investment and a home to tens and thousands of South Africans. There is even and Nando's in, 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 in Qatar, you do find a lot of South African business and professional people who reside in this part of our world. And then of course, South Africa's interest in this region also is for our own national interest, but also we have interest in the peace and security issues. Uh, we do have very good relations with our, of course, with, with, uh, bilaterally with a number of countries here. We do have affinity with the question of Palestine. Uh, in fact, the Palestinian issue is, uh, is very, very strong in the South African national psyche, both in the, even, in the, in, even in the Jewish community, which is very, very strong in South Africa. 
At the same time, this region, uh, uh, South Africa has an emotional and also a spiritual point with this, uh, with this region because thousands of South African Muslims make a privilege, uh, a pilgrimage, have visited Saudi Arabia for the Hajj and Umrah over many years. And it's a well established, there are, there are a lot of South Africans uh, who, uh, who come uh, regularly to this region. And South Africa's interest in the Gulf region is built on two tenets, namely the economic development of our country and the promotion of peace and security in the region. Integrated trade and investment have been our initial point of contact after the attainment of democracy, but our 20 years of relations have brought about a myriad of different areas of cooperation between us and, and this part of the world. We've got a joint uh, with, 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 with the UAE, we have, a, we have a joint commission that was self-established when President Zuma was here in, in 2011. And, 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 and South Africa, of course, has always been, has been successful in attracting investment from the GCC region, including the world that we know. We also get a lot of tourists from, from this part of the world. But Madam Chair, I want to f conclude by some few thoughts on the future. I've suggested some areas where the two regions can work together. I've suggested partnership. I've suggested collaboration and cooperation in international organizations, the language and religion, path, peacemaking, and so on. But I think that we, we have to think about what are the scenarios for the future in the relations between, uh, the, in the, relations between the African and Afro-Arab. And I think there are going to be some key drivers to influence the relations between our two regions. And perhaps these drivers, like all drivers in scenario mapping, will be debatable. The first one is the resolution of the Palestinian question. Once the Palestinian question is resolved and Palestine become a sovereign state in the two-state model that many of us, Palestine will recede and disappear in the minds of many of the people on the African continent. So it will less and less become a bond and that creates, it will less and less become a bond that links Africa and the, the people of the Arab and the Middle East and, and, and the Middle East. So like South Africa, there was a time when the struggle for South Africa was on everybody's list, but today we don't talk about anti-apartheid struggle. Everybody has forgotten, even others maybe have even forgotten about Nelson Mandela. So the same will happen even with Palestine. When the Palestinians get their independence, their freedom, they will become less and less uh, a factor in the relations between our two regions. So that's the first key driver. And then the second key driver, of course, is the, is the, what is going to be the impact of two main trends we see in this part of the world. One, political Islam, and second, the so-called Arab Spring. What sort of impact it will have in, on the states and the nature of the states in this part of the world. I think it's also a second driver. The third driver, of course, is the economic and developmental issues. And for us from the African question, uh, continent, the issue is whether Africa will ever realize its full potential. In the 19, uh, I mean, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, we used to talk about Africa rising, even in the 1930s, and so on and so on. Even today, we're talking about Africa. Will Africa ever rise? That's the question. And this time, we think that Africa will rise. So if Africa, when the more Africa becomes a stronger player, and so on and so on, I think also it's going to become a key driver in how the relations between the two regions pan out in the future. And then the, 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 the fourth driver is the overall rise of the South. Will this configuration we are talking about, or the, the, the change in the balance of forces between the traditional powers and the South countries, so will it ever occur, and where will Africa be, and also the Arab world be in that configuration? It's something that I think will influence how the future pan out. And of course, finally, the key driver is the behavior of the world powers in this region and on the African continent. Currently on the African continent, of course, they're in pursuit of natural resources. They are quite active in regime change. They are quite active on the African continent in influencing and influencing behavior, not only of states, but also of elites and trying to influence who becomes president. So the, the role of the big powers cannot be excluded in how we think as a driver that's going to influence how the two regions evolve in the future and so on. And I think there are, there are likely three likely scenarios and there is debatable. The first scenario is that the relations between Africa and the Arab world will continue but at low key, 
dominated by the orientation of the, or the primary orientation of the two regions towards their traditional Western world. So the, it, will, it will be like the Arab world and Africa have a relationship, have a, they're working together, but it's low key because both regions are putting emphasis on their relations with the traditional Western powers. So that's the first scenario. The second scenario is the, that the relations between the two regions are active on political and economic fronts in particular, and the two regions assert themselves in the emerging South-dominated international order. So assuming that this South-dominated international order emerges and the two regions become part of it, become an active part of it, and play an active role, and their relationship then develops in, in that context. So that's the second scenario. And the third scenario is, of course, for the relations between the two regions to continue, but only in the economic and the cultural field. So mainly in trade, investments, and also in language promotion, in, Islam, in religions, and so on, but with little impact on the, on the politics and the world affairs. So these are, these are the three scenarios that I see, and I don't know which one, I can't pick one because scenario mapping is just a projection into the future. And then once again, uh, let me take this opportunity for thanking you here. I hope I didn't take a lot of your time. And of course, uh, Director, you have said thank you very much, and also my regards to your colleague, the Director General, and my ambassador who's here. So I've tried to, to cover uh, a broad area of Afro-Arab relations in the past, in the present, and the likelihoods that uh, uh, for the future. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Maloka, let me just say thank you for the lovely lecture. And I would just want to say that I think after this lecture, we know that our relationship with the African continent exceeds that of the geographical boundaries. And I think, if I can say, it is malleable and penetrable. Like, it's, it's a two-way relationship. It is never... An, I liked when you said, like, you... Um, feel for the Palestinian cause. That means you get affected with it. And certainly, the Arab world does get affected also by the African, you know, relation, African topics. Also, I liked your three scenarios at the end, and I hope that we get more of interaction than what you said is economical and, you know, industrial. And I, and I hope it will be better for Africa in the future. So thank you very much. Um, and now we will, continue, we will continue with our lecture and we will start with our Q and A's. But please let, me, let be advised that the questions should be short and the person who will be asking should introduce themselves. Let's start. Gentleman in the beginning there, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, the lecture. Uh, my name is Radwan, and I'm from the uh, uh, Abu Dhabi University. Um, of course, you talked about uh, the Arabs and the Africans uh, overlap, and uh, you alluded to uh, issues. My question is related to the Arab Spring started in Tunisia, moved east, crossed to Asia, north, south, and Tunisia is part of Africa, so in a way it's partially at least an African spring. As an African uh, person, not Arab, how do you see Africa affected by that, by that spring? Uh, it's certainly affected in some way or another, but if you look at the future, is it going to go south? Uh, is it going to be confined to the Arab world? We see now Daesh, for example, people join from, from Australia, from Europe, from America, and, and Africa is, is next door, so to speak. How do you see that, you know, from your viewpoint, the future of this uh, spring, if we want to call it? Thank you. We take another question. Yes, so the gentleman in the back. Can you please raise your hand? Keep. Thank you. My name is Osama Mkhimar, editor, 
Media Department. Uh, Professor Maluka, thank you very much for your comprehensive, deep lecture. Uh, mentioning the Arab-African relations, you have mentioned development, peace and security, democratization. What about the external role in brief? What about the external role of in some international and regional powers like Turkey, China, Iran, and these relations as you see it? Take, for example, the Ethiopian Dam and the external support that uh, Ethiopia gets from uh, regional powers or international powers. How can you see uh, th this? Thank you so much. Another question? Yeah, the lady in the front, please. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Amina. I am a researcher in the African uh, studies. I lived in Africa from 2009 until 2013, and I thank God that I went to this uh, continent. I considered it uh, really lost, especially for a lot uh, of the Gulf people. I have a question for you. Uh, Mexico, uh, in the past century, in the 30s, it used to be governed by a king, Edward Farajas. At the time, Mexico was filled with civil wars. A number of uh, uh, political scientists went to the king and they told him, what is the problem of Mexico? He told them uh, the problem of Mexico is it is very close to the United States of America and very far from God. My question for you, what is the problem of Africa in general? Second, uh, Professor Edward, it is said that the African continent, I lived that and I really saw the international com uh, competitiveness in the continent. How do you see the future of uh, the uh, continent, African continent, especially after uh, the active presence uh, of Iran and Israel there? Do you see that this is a competitiveness, especially in the presence of the first man of Iran, Mr. Brahim Zakdaki in Nigeria? Second, the second man in Ethiopia, and he is the Ethiopian Jewish uh, businessman, Tito. He uh, is the owner of Jito. Uh, how do you see the future of Africa after all these developments? Thank you very much. I will, st I will start with the last question because uh, it's, uh, it's a question posed by my daughter, Amina. Uh, my daughter's name is Amina, so thank you very much. Uh, it's a very difficult question, but it's also linked to the, the question about, uh, which was raised by our brother, about the role of external powers and, the, and what is the likely impact of the external powers. He mentioned Turkey, he mentioned Iran, I can't remember the other one that he mentioned. Uh, let, let me let me ask the question: What is the real problem of that is Africa? I think the uh, our problems are interrelated, and uh, and it's perhaps something that is not a factor here in, uh, in 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 this part of the world, but it is a factor in Africa. That in Africa the colonialists never left. You see. Uh, and in the 50 years of our freedom, we were not successful in kicking them out of our continent once and for all. And it's the reality we live. And, uh, and that uh, the system of colonialism has continued in our continent in a different form. And it has created uh, particular forms of states, and it has also created particular forms of economies. Our economies, by, la, by and large, and of course there are few exceptions, few exceptions, by and large, our economies are externally oriented and commodity based. No infrastructure, what you produce, you send to the ports you take, and in most cases you take to the former colonial master. And it comes back to you, if, you pro, if you're exporting cacao, it comes back to you as chocolate. I saw, a, I saw a documentary the other day about an Ivorian, an Ivorian cocoa farmer who for the first time in his life tasted chocolate and said, all the years, this is what I've been doing. And that's the real problem we face. And, and in this political economy, in these countries, so you, you export, 
what you don't need, what you don't, what you don't, you export, it's mainly raw material, unprocessed, non-value added, you export it, it comes back to in manufactured goods, there's only one road, maybe the road goes to the present house and also goes to the ports. Otherwise, everybody, there's darkness, there's no electricity, there are no roads. And this is the political economy we inherited from the colonial period. And for the 50 years of our independence, we never managed to turn it around. And in the, in the regions where, including in South Africa, some people will say South Africa is the most developed economy on the continent, there's infrastructure, there's roads, and so on. Yes, but it's because in South Africa we had a different form of colonialism where the colonizer was living side by side with the colonized. So if you go to Johannesburg, it's a fully developed city with infrastructure, but you go nearby where I grew up in Soweto, it's like any developing country. So within South Africa itself, President and former President Beck used to talk of the two nations, you have a teen ocean scenario where because of the legacy of where the colonizer lives side by side with the colonized, you find other conditions, you find elsewhere on the continent, you find in the black townships, in the so-called historical Bantu stands where black people used to live. And where white people used to live, you find roads, you find infrastructure, and it's one of the things holding back our country in education, in, in creating jobs, in building up our economy, because we have a huge backlog. But we cannot blame colonialism forever. So the challenge is to try, us as Africans, to try to turn the things around. That's why I was saying that, will Africa ever rise? And I think this time it will. Because I sit, I listen to our leaders, we work with our leaders, we see there is a change with what is happening on the continent now. There are leaders, every leader now, there's competition on the continent, who's going to have a road, who's going to have an electricity project, who's going to have a, a, a bridge, who's going everywhere on the continent, every leader is trying to build roads, every leader. But in the past, I was told there's one leader uh, on the continent, uh, I was told by Professor Seth Adedeji, you, some of you know him, he was telling me he visited one head of state in his village. There's no road going to the head of state's village, so he has to come by helicopter, he gets there. And then he says, Mr. President, let me work with you and we build a road here. He says, you are mad, you want to build a road so that these people can come and kill me. No, 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 they must fly to come here. So that was the mentality then. But today the mentality is different. Every leader you go, in my job where I am, we go to so many capitals. Every leader is trying to build a bridge, trying to build a hydro project, trying to build this, is trying to build it. The, chain, the game is changing. But there is a second thing. Every leader, I remember when we were creating a forum for former heads of states, which now is, a, is active on the continent. It's a club of former African heads of state. We said, no, this club of leaders, it must be about peace and security. So when there are conflicts, uh, mediation, we deploy these leaders. And then it must be developmental. They must champion development issues. They must also deal with issues of HIV and AIDS and so on and so on. And we went to the inaugural meeting. And we presented this uh, framework and so on. And these leaders, one after another, took the and said, but how do we form this thing when we don't talk about the democratization of our own continent? That one of the things that we must do, we must make sure that we improve and we make our governments accountable. So it's, 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 a, it's and, uh, but then there are different ways. Then you have instances where a leader maybe has to come to, his term has to come to an end, and he thinks, hey, the people still need me. Maybe I don't live now, I change the constitution. And you saw what happened in Burkina Faso. So then you have a third element that the African people themselves, from the 1990s, they have a limited level of tolerance. So they can tolerate their leaders, but up to a certain point. So we saw now what is happening in Burkina Faso when President Compraure, it was, he went, so they then go to the, they say no. But he responded very well. He had an option. He could have, he could have, uh, 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 opted for intransigence and stayed in power, the country will be divided, it will be civil war, but he did the most honorable thing and he resigned and he went to live in Cote d'Ivoire just to let the situation come down. So the environment on the continent is changing. And, and now when you sit, now there's a big debate now on the continent, you sit, it's on self-reliance that we must finance our own institution because Africa is one of the most donor-dependent continent. Many of our countries, even to build schools, they depend on donors. Fiscal, you know, budgets, your own by national budgets, you get budget support from foreigners. And so, but that's also is changing. A number of leaders are beginning to say, no, I don't want 
a government to come and help me do this. And there's a big debate now on this to say, how do we make sure that we finance our own institutions? There's a task team of heads of state, which is led by President Obasanjo, and he was presenting his report, I think, about a year ago or so, at the summit of the African Union. So there are some proposals, and some of them are going to affect certain countries and so on. And he said, but you must be serious. This is going to be a cost, but you can't keep on asking for donors to pay for your own organization. And everybody clapped their hands, and that's how the, the decision was taken. So there is a thinking, a very strong thinking, that we must pay our bills, we must pay ourselves, but also on peace and security, we have a problem. We had an incident in Mali, and everybody was embarrassed. We had to go and ask the French to come and assist us. And the French did it in a very honorable way. President Hollande consulted his foreign minister. They were consulting. They said, look, this is not the neo-colonial interventions of the past. We want to work with Africa. It was, a, it was, they were working with us. Now it's a different philosophy, not like the olden days when they will talk of the resource design and they will send the intervention force without consulting. So they were consulting with us. But African leaders said, but we can't allow this. What is Africa's biggest problem? It's peace and security. We can't allow a situation where if there is a peace and security problem, there is conflict in our neighborhood, we have to go and ask our friends in the north. Of course, they, they want to work with us, but what is it that we must do? That's why then there is now a, a process to establish an African Rapid Response Force to crisis. It's called a CERC. And, uh, and, and, and our president, President Zuma, is, is being the leading voice on this, and we went around the continent and with the African Union, working with other countries, and so on. And what they did is that the president of the African Union Commission wrote to member states and said, you have a decision, do you want to volunteer? And it's on voluntary basis. Countries are volunteering a hospital, a brigade, a host, uh, this, and so on and so on, because they are saying that if there is a problem in country A, African countries themselves must be able to respond and deploy. And you must be able to leave and deploy and be in that country for 30 days without asking for money. So you must be able to sustain ourselves. So what I'm trying to say, Amina, is that, yes, we have this problem that we have inherited. And the last 50 years, I can say, we are not successful in overcoming them. And these problems are structural. They inhibit the development of our continent. But I think, maybe because I'm young, maybe I'm naive, Maybe I believe what our leaders are saying. Maybe I believe what Africans are saying in the street. But I see there is a change. And I think that is going to be quite different in the future and so on. And then we talk about the, the external players, uh, powers, Turkey, Iran. I'm not sure whether Turkey is that. Uh, it's active. There is, a, there is a mechanism now, the partnership between Turkey and, and Africa. And uh, I don't know. It's going to be taking place now, the meeting in, in Malabo in Equatorial Guinea. I think Turkey, bilaterally between South Africa and Turkey, we've got quite good relations and so on. But I'm not sure that uh, Turkey is as active in the region as it is uh, in, the, in this part of the world. So I can't speak. Maybe in West Africa, I don't know. I, I don't feel it in Southern Africa where I am. But bilaterally, we do have good relations. And also the same applies with Iran. We do have a joint mechanism. We have a joint commission with Iran and so on. And of course, we used to buy most of our oil from Iran and we had to cut because of the sanctions. Uh, and perhaps... In, in some areas, uh, you may make a point that in some areas Iran plays a role, maybe in West Africa, but in, where I am and in the space where I operate in the African Union, in the sub-regional and in this, and, the, uh, and in the, I, don't see, I don't feel the impact of, or the influence of Turkey, I don't feel the, the influence of Iran. But the influence that I do feel, of course, is of the traditional powers. The French are still influential in Africa. The Americans are still influential on the African continent, and less so for the Brits. Uh, and even the Portuguese are not that influential. It's mainly cultural language ties with the former Portuguese colonies. But the two countries that are still active on the continent is the French and the, and the Americans. They are quite influential, and they're still a force you feel in, in the meetings, you feel... And so on, and, and, quite, and, and they do play a, a role, and then we work together, and so on. On the issue of the, the first question, uh, how Africa was affected by the Arab Spring, you are correct. Tunisia is an African country, and we didn't see there's something happening in the Arab world. We saw it as something happening on the African continent, and uh, even us who are in the south. But for us, it was not a new experience, because we in South Africa... And in Southern Africa, we had just toppled the white 
minority colonial governments. In Zimbabwe, we toppled them in 1980. We created, it was an uprising, an armed struggle in Namibia, 1990, uh, 1980, Zimbabwe, 1990, and then, of course, South Africa, 1994. So in our region, there is a legacy and a culture of mass militancy and engagement. So it's, it's not something that uh, we couldn't relate to and, and, and so on. And, and, and as I said, in the 1990s, there was a democratization wave in, in Francophone African countries, in East Africa, in, everywhere, it marches, people see what you see now in Burkina Faso. It happened in many African countries in the 1990s, forcing governments to change constitutions, to change presidents, to retire, and all those kind of things, and so on. And the, and, and the, the, I think the, the Arab Spring, it's, uh, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's, it has come to an end. I think it's the transition. Like, for example, we had the end of the Cold War in 1990. 1989, 1990, and we thought it ended long time ago. But now, with what is happening in Ukraine and Russia, you realize that actually we still live in the post -cold, post Cold War transition. So some of the transitions can be very long. So I think we're still living through a transition, and uh, and it's too early to say what is the likely impact. But on the African continent, people don't see it as something happening out there in the Arab world. They see it as something that is happening on the African continent, but they connect it to other processes, what's happening in Burkina Faso is mass popular demands on those in the leadership to say, we want this, we want to change this. But the, the trick is, is, is part of, of course, it's quite a, 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 an important development, but the trick is what you get out of it. The Egyptians have a different account of what came out of it and they will debate with you. In other parts of the country, and then, of course, in Zambia, we also had a similar, uh, when with the democratization there, you had Kenneth Kaunda who was, toppled, who was removed through a democratic route, but the government that got in there, some people will say it was worse than that of Kenneth Kaunda. So the, the, the experience of the Arab Spring, that's why some people are saying, is this the spring or the winter? We don't know. Because the question is that the masses will go to the streets, demand the government to dissolve, demand the change of the constitution, but the trick is in the... It's in the leap from that to the new government. And I don't think that's where the difficult thing. You may have an outcome which is not necessarily connected to the intentions of the masses and the people in the street. You may have a, an outcome that negates, that is, runs counter to what was intended by the popular uprisings and so on. So, I, so we, we still live in that transition, in my view. It will take a while. The new governments are still coming in Tunisia. They're still struggling. They've just had this whole process. Of course, the Egyptians are also coming out of, uh, of their own transition and so on. So I, in, in my view, I think it's just too early to say what's going to happen in the same way that even in South Africa, 20 years out after our freedom, we're still living and trying to struggle with the kind of state we should be creating to, to replace that we had during apartheid. So I'm just saying that it's still the transition and perhaps it's too early to know exactly what's going to happen, what sort of states and regimes will come out of this so-called Arab Spring. Uh, thank you, Professor Maloka. I wish we can have more time to discuss deeper into the African-Arabic relationship, but we are short on time. But before we conclude, I would to just inform the guests that uh, next week the ECSSR is holding its 20th energy conference, annual conference, on the 18th and the 19th of November. It's our pleasure if you can attend. And please... You are invited now to the dinner in the ECSSR uh, dining hall. You can follow the instructions or some of our colleagues can show you the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.